Hello, and thank you for joining me once again on my program. I've got a message tonight that I want to bring to you, and I've entitled it, More Than a Pretty Song. More Than a Pretty Song. Well, what am I talking about? Stay with me tonight. I've got words of God's love and mercy that I want to share with you tonight. And I'm going to be looking at three specific areas. The first one, we're going to do kind of a status checkup on ourselves, our spiritual condition. And then the second one, we're going to look at the churches and the shepherds that Ezekiel was talking about. And then the third area that we will look into tonight is the blessing of the Lord his blessings that he wants to pour out on God's children. So if you would like to hear more about those blessings, stay with me now. Let's begin in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a prophet of God and God had sent him to speak to the nations, speak to nations that were not walking with God. In fact, they were against God. God tells Ezekiel what to say. And I'm going to use the Amplified Bible Classic Edition for this particular reading, beginning in Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 30 to 33. As for you, son of man, now he's talking to Ezekiel, your people who talk of you by the walls and in the doors of the houses say one to another, every one of you to his brother, Come and, and hear what the word is that comes forth from the Lord. And they come to you as people come, and they sit before you as my people, and they hear the words you say, but they'll not do them. For with their mouths they show much love, but with their hearts go after and are set on their idolatrous greed for gain. Behold, you are to them a very lovely love song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument, for they hear your words, but they do not do them. When this comes to pass, for behold, it will, then shall they know, understand, and realize that a prophet has been among them. Okay. Let's dwell on these verses for just a few minutes. God's actually speaking to Ezekiel in advance. He says, for these will come to pass. He's preparing Ezekiel's heart to understand and be ready for the reactions of the people. You know, whenever I speak to an audience, I, I see them paying attention. Some are writing notes, taking notes, and I'm thinking, Wow, they're getting it. And they're nodding their heads and their eyes are on me. And as the speaker, the God's vessel for the night, I get so excited in my heart thinking they're paying attention. God is going to do something big here. God says to Ezekiel, no matter what you see the people doing, understand this. They will give you lip service at the moment, but when they leave here, they won't do what you just told them. Wow. What if I thought when I speak to that group and they're taking their notes and they're going like this, that the minute they walk out, it was all lost. My heart would be broken. God loves his servant. And so he tells Ezekiel in advance, they're going to listen, but they won't do. Wow. You know, there's always a blessing for those who do hear and do, but there's also a curse for those who do hear, but don't do. There will be no blessing. So God tells Ezekiel that the people to come that are going to come to him, not as believers, but they're coming to him for the sole source of like entertainment. Entertainment. You know, I, I, I read that and I thought, entertainment? 
Verse 32, let's look at it again. Behold, you are to them as a very lovely love song. This is the prophet of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument for they hear your words and they do not do them. Okay, I want to point out one of the first signs that God points out to Ezekiel to know if the people are hearing and if they're doing what you tell them. You see, the first uh, sign that we have, if, if somebody hears us, but they don't do it, they didn't hear us with their heart. They heard us with their ears, only their ears. They're hearing you like just your voice. They're not hearing what's the spirit side. Why won't they listen to Ezekiel? And why won't they make a change? I wondered as I read through, why, Lord? But he gave us the answer. He said, it's greed. He said, they show you much love. They shake your hand on Sunday, Pastor. That was an awesome service. But they don't do what you just told them. Why? They're afraid that if they do what you tell them from God's Word, well, they might lose everything. They might lose the very things they've been working so hard to gain. Wow. Wow. And therefore, God's blessings can't be poured out. They have an idolatrous greed for gain. They're not following after, wholly after God. They're following after Him on Sunday as the thing to do. I want to address the churches now. I told you I had three parts. So now I'm moving straight into the churches and the shepherds. I want to look at that one. In, his, in chapter 4 of Ezekiel, God points out irresponsible shepherds to Ezekiel. And so Ezekiel addresses that. Let's begin in verse 1 of chapter 4, uh, 34 of Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the, sh to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Should not the shepherds feed the flock? What food are the shepherds to give to the flock? Well, in the New Testament, Jesus refers to himself as the bread of life. Our shepherds are to be feeding God's Word, God's Word to the people. But how many today of our churches, and, and I'm not naming churches, you may have been in one and you may be in one, and you may never have, and I pray that you haven't. But there are churches, even this hour, that spoon feed a portion of a scripture and then the rest of the service is from their own thinking. You didn't get enough food to even satisfy. But I'm not going to lay this all at the pastor's feet. Because you know what? The Bible says that we as the sheep, as the congregation, as the people, we will begin to seek out preachers, shepherds that will tell us what we want to hear, that'll tell us everything we want to hear. They often go to these churches because it's the place to be. When I was young, it was frowned upon socially if, if you didn't go to church on Sunday. Why? Everybody put on their Sunday suit. We, was, we always called it our Sunday best. And everybody 
that was anybody got in their cars and they went to church. It was the place to be, the thing to do. It wasn't that they were demanding that you serve Jesus, but it was the appropriate place on Sunday to be. Now, many in those days, and I'm going to tell you in a second why I think this, but many in those days went there because it was a lovely song. There was beautiful music. There were people that they could rub shoulders with and say hi to. It was the right place to be socially, maybe even career-wise. But I want you to look at the generations as they go through. You can see so many of our children today in this generation, uh, each generation progressively have had maybe less word given to them. And I'm calling for our generations to return and go back to the word, began to eat the word. God is calling us literally out of the churches that are not feeding. There are churches that are feeding. They are giving you the word, the word. The word brings life. Let your heart begin to be hungry for the word. So God tells us he's going to send his own shepherd in Ezekiel 34, 23 through 24. I will establish one shepherd over them and he shall feed them. My servant David, he shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken. He's declared it. You see, when God declares, speaks something, it's forever in the atmosphere. Can't be changed, adjusted, changed in any way. He said, I'm going to be their God. There's another reason that God's going to intervene. And it's not one that we necessarily think of. And it's actually found in Ezekiel chapter 36. So I started in 34, we went through 35, and now we're into 36. I'm going to begin in verse 21, still in the Amplified Bible. But I had regard, concern, and compassion for my holy name. This is God speaking. Which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations to which they went. You see, God wants his name to be kept pure. Now, let me give you some examples. Do you know of someone, maybe who has a famous name, maybe um, there's someone really important in the company or where you work or, or in the community, but they've got a imp- big name. Everybody recognizes that name. What if they had a really poor reputation for coming through? Oh, they're big on promises. You meet them somewhere, maybe the TV cameras are rolling and they shake hands and they give promises. But once the TV camera is shut off and they step into their real world, the promises don't go with them. Wow. Their reputation. We don't respect this person, do we? We see them, but we think, they're not going to do that. I know them. I've seen them. God says, I will not let my name be drugged through the mud. I will not break a promise because you'll know it. And if I break a promise, you will always wonder what was the next promise I will break. So God says, for my own namesake, I will never break a promise. He never has, folks, and he never will. He will always guard his name. Why would he need to guard his name? Because you and I need to be able to step out on this word and stand on it like it's concrete. We need to be able to stand on this solid rock. If he broke a promise, there could be a crack in the solid rock. There is no crack in the solid rock. He never breaks a promise. God tells us that he will not allow his name to be smeared. And so in verse 22, he says, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sakes, 
O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations to which you went. Okay, moving on. I want us to go with God makes it well known to the children that he's not pulling them out of their messes because they deserve it. Have you ever heard somebody say, you know, I don't, God just intervened, but I, I didn't deserve it. Sometimes God wants you to have a testimony among the people. So the people know that it was God that did it, not you. God that did it. You know, when the Israelites crossed that Red Sea on dry land and all the sea walls backed up like this and all those Israelites go across with their chariots, their horses, their tents, everything they had to carry, all the world to this day knows it was God. It could be no other way. And he says, I will make sure that it's not about you, but it's all about him. Verse 23, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name and separate it for its holy purpose from all that defiles it. My name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned among them, and the nations will know, understand, and realize that I, the Lord, the sovereign ruler, who calls forth loyalty and obedient service, when I shall be set apart by you and my holiness vindicated in you before their eyes and yours, then I will sprinkle the clean water upon you. And let's go on to verse 26. A new heart will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and you shall heed my ordinances and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. I will also save you from your uncleanness and I will call forth the grain and make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. When we follow after God, I mean, wholly, completely follow after God. Something changes. God sees it. He knows so much so that he told Ezekiel in advance. He knows when we're listening with our ears or when we're listening with our heart. He knows when our words are speaking from the, from the mind of greed are from the heart of obedience. You see that your, your words will speak from one source or the other. The mind of greed or the heart of obedience will be producing our words. God knows that. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, back into the New King James Version. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Isn't that what Ezekiel said in chapter 36? He said, I'm going to give you a new heart and a new spirit. I'm going to take away that, that heart of stone. And I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. And I'm going to put a spirit within you. Folks, if you've never experienced the relationship with Jesus, then you have yet to experience life, a spirit of life that begins to come inside of you and of cleanness. There's a wholeness like, like before that it was empty. There was just like a shadow over your life, a dream or a hope. But when Jesus comes in, he is our hope. And our dreams are of the future, a bright future, a new heart. God wants, he desires to give a new heart, a new creation. We're not the old creation. In chapters 34 tonight, we've, we've sort of gone on a journey. Let's call it that. God tells people to quit going to churches just to... Um, Think of him as a pretty song, as a beautiful song. Oh, isn't it lovely? No. 
those who, who go to church and they sit in the pews Sunday after Sunday, or are we doing it because our wife wants us to go, or our husband wants us to go, or, or maybe our employer thinks it's a good thing for us? Um, maybe our family will get off our case if I go to church on Sunday. I'll go and I'll sit and I'll, I'll do everything they want me to do. They'll never know that I'm not doing what they think I am. If I just show up on Sunday, they'll let go. They'll be happy. How many of you are going through all the emotions, the emotions of being a Christian, and yet you don't know God? What a waste, folks. What a waste of a blessing. I, my heart breaks, and I, if only God would give me words that I have yet to know to reach out and say, God loves you. God desires to bless you beyond all the, your wildest dreams. You know the good song that Sunday you might think of it as, the lovely song? God's got that song that he wants to put inside your heart like one you've never heard, a love song. God is more than God. He is our Father that loves us, that gave His Son the love that He has. God pours out disgust, literally disgust for shepherds who would waste a pulpit time, who would literally throw away a golden opportunity to stand at a pulpit of our many churches. God is watching the pastors, folks. He gave them an opportunity to come and stand behind a podium not to entertain you. Oh, if only we could understand. It's the Word brings life. Do you need a healing tonight? It's found in here, but the shepherd needs to be preaching it. Do you need repentance tonight? It's found in here, but the shepherd must preach it. Do you need financial blessings? It's found in here, but we shepherds must preach it. You know, I want to just take a moment to say thank you, Lord, for every shepherd who honors the pulpit and the people, the sheepfold that God has given. God has entrusted many, many sheep under the, the wings of his shepherds. So it's a, Ezekiel gives from the word of God a warning to everyone that would waste the pulpit. I don't know how else to say it. 2 Timothy 4 and 3, For the time will come will they, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. I ask you tonight, let your own desire be laid aside just long enough for God to step in and show you what he's really got so that blessing upon blessing can be yours. So much more than you could ever dream is right there for you. Let me show you just a few things that false shepherds will try to lead their congregation into. I felt led to carry this in tonight. One, they find out what you want to hear. That's what the scripture just said. They find out what you want to hear and that's what they're going to give you. Two, there are those that would keep you burdened with doubt about your salvation. Well, how do they do that? It's simple. They tie your salvation to good works. Well, I thought we were supposed to do good works. Yes, we are. After salvation... You don't lose salvation because your good works are slipping. Salvation is what God gives that to you as a free gift. It wouldn't be a free gift if, if good works were tied to it. Now, would it? For the gift of God 
It's not works, folks. We can get so bogged down in thinking we need to earn salvation. You know, I've been listening to testimony after testimony recently. My husband and I both have been hearing these testimonies. They're true ones. They're real. They're from other religions. They're right here in the United States. And these are religions that taught that they had to do good works in order to earn their way into heaven. What happened to the blood of Jesus? What happened to the gift? For God so loved the world that he gave. We destroy the whole John 3, 16 when we attach works. Oh, God's got plenty of works for us, but it'll be the ones that he desired for us, that he had planned for us before the foundations of the earth. He's got plans for you. You can always read Jeremiah 29, 11. He's got plans for you. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, through the blood of Jesus. So the first thing we want to know is, are you believing that Jesus is the Son of God? Jesus died for your sins, and God raised him from the dead the third day. Now confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you believe that, confess him, Lord, I want you in my heart, and I will serve you all the days of my life. I won't go to church just to hear a good song anymore. And I want you to know something. When you do that, God has got blessings. Every promise in here suddenly became your inheritance. Life, wholesomeness, cleanness. If you've got a habit that you feel bound and burdened with, bring it to Jesus. It'll be gone. He knows how to take it away. You know, I want you to keep inviting your friends to the programs. Every Wednesday, I'm on the program. Bring a friend, invite them, ask them to come. God's got a message for the people and you can be my outreach. You can be the one that goes and brings them in. I need you to gather them in for me. I pray that you'll be blessed and I'll see you next week. We hope you've enjoyed Kingdom Ministries with Reverend D. Levins. For more from Dee, read The Long, Long Night, The Story of Destiny, and Echoes from God, a Christian study book for growing deep and strong in the faith. Connect with Dee and purchase her books at dlevins.com. Send an email to dlevinstv at gmail.com or text Dee at 254-681-6099.